My company is called Inboard Technology, and we're a company that's focused on completely revolutionizing the personal electric vehicle industry. Now, personal electric vehicles are probably new to most people. You might not have heard that term before, uh, and that's because transportation is changing at the fastest time ever in the last 100 years. So the, today I'm going to talk to you about the ways that we're getting around specifically urban areas today and how big of a shift we're going to see over the next 10 years and how products like the inboard M1 here are going to become a staple of this new transportation paradigm shift. Oh, who remembers seeing these things? It was like 2002. They came out. They were $12,000. I really, really wanted one. They were super cool. And everyone talked about how they were going to completely change the way that we got around urban areas, how we actually did transportation. And they were super cool, and it was a great technology, and it was a great need for personal mobility. But there were a few huge challenges. Dean Kamen, one of the creators of the Segway, uh, talked about Segway parking lots, Segway charging stations. Can you imagine trying to get a Segway like this into an elevator? Like, not going to happen. And so it was a great technology, but it was a technology that was trying to get society to change for it. And I remember back in, you know, kind of the mid-1990s, there was a show on Discovery Channel called Beyond 2000, and they would talk about all these new technologies that was going to happen. And one was self-driving cars. And they were going to put these pucks in the roads, like built into the roads, these metal pucks that would have um, magnets, and as the cars would drive over them, they would read the pucks and they would know where to go. You know, here we are 30 years later, and there's no pucks in any roads. We've created technology that works within society. It's very difficult to try and get society to change for your new technology and invention. So what ended up happening with Segways? Um, well, unfortunately, they kind of went to mall cops uh, and police like this. Uh, and there's a lot of really good YouTube videos of people falling and uh, you know, getting hurt. Um, this is kind of your traditional Segway taking off. And then this one's difficult to see, but it's Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world, with the cameraman next to him and him swooping and taking them out. Um, so this was 2002, Segway was created, and it was $12,000. Uh, a few years later, we had this, uh, 2015, and this was about $300 to $400. Um, so what happened in that period of time? Uh, we saw a lot of new innovations in mobile devices and drones and reduction in battery costs, and that's how we were able to get the product so much cheaper. Um, unfortunately, even though it was cheaper, it was still inherently the same problem. Uh, it was very unstable, uh, and if you just go in and you type hoverboard fail, there's no shortage of really great videos. Uh, one of my personal favorites is Mike Tyson here. Um, so again, you know, Segway was great. Everybody really liked the idea of it. It was too big, it was too heavy, it was way too expensive. And then you start to shift and you go into hoverboards and it's more affordable. It's lighter weight, it's more compact, but it's still inherently stable. And so if you're looking at this from like a macro kind of investment perspective, you're starting to see these little blips, but they don't kind of stick around. And then there's another blip and it doesn't stick around. So, but it does show that there's an interest here, that people want freedom of mobility. They want lightweight electric vehicles that they can take with them. And this market's called personal electric vehicles or rideables. And rideables are defined by being lightweight, so under 25 pounds. The M1 here is 15 pounds, so I can easily pick it up and I can take it with me. Um, it's got to be energy efficient, so it's electric. You know, that's going to allow me to use it and keep the cost of ownership very, very low. Um, it's got to be clean, it's got to be green, um, and it's got to be compact. And it has to go anywhere. And the great thing about personal electric vehicles is that if I need to jump in the back of an Uber, if I have to get off a train, if I have to go on a bus, it works within society as we currently live today. It's not like the Segway where you needed Segway parking lots. I can take this thing with me wherever I want, throw it in the back of my car, throw it underneath a coffee table if I'm meeting some friends for a, for a bite to eat or a coffee. And so it really lives with me. Uh, and this is it. It's the M1. What we wanted to do is create the coolest, uh, most streamlined personal electric vehicle that's ever been created. Now, most people say, well, it's still a skateboard. But a skateboard has four wheels, four contact points with the ground, versus the Segway or the hoverboard, which was two wheels and inherently unstable. If you hit a bump on one of those, it becomes you know, very unstable and you start to fall down. And our goal while launching with this product is to slowly create a complete ecosystem of products and different form factors that are safe, 
easy to use, and allow you to get around an urban area with ease. And so the big opportunity here, and the one thing I really want to drive home today, is whether you want to get on an electric skateboard or a scooter or a different mobility platform, cities are changing, and transportation is changing massively. And for the first time in about 100 years, we can reshape our cities. And 100 years ago, if you were in a city, they had pollution for transportation. Unfortunately, the pollution was from a horse. It was a very different type of pollution. We don't have to worry about those things anymore. Uh, we have a different type of pollution, and now we want to see a shift again towards green and clean energy. And so if you were around 100 years ago, um, you know, trying to cross the street, you had to look out for a horse, and today it's a car. What I'm going to present today is how, through a combination of new technologies, we're going to completely redefine the way that we live in urban areas. And it's due to a number of technological convergences. So first is artificial intelligence. Um, you're starting to see this with uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, the second is mobile devices. Uh, once cell phones came on the market, accelerometers, low-cost gyroscopes, um, you know, uh, very high-power you know, mobile processors, all of a sudden, because cell phones drove down the cost of all those components, you had an industry like the drone industry. Drones weren't even possible in 2005 because the components were way too expensive. Um, and so because you had mobile phones and uh, smartphones, you were able to have drones. Uh, because of drones and the increase in electric vehicles, you were able to have advances in battery technology, massive, massive uh, changes in battery technology. And if you look at the M1 here, it's super thin. It looks like a normal skateboard. And these existed in the 1990s, but they had a huge battery that stuck underneath them. Uh, and that was the reason that they, that they were so heavy. They weren't compact. You weren't able to take them with you. Um, we're seeing a huge shift in the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, I think you can see every month a new car company, a new auto manufacturer is saying, we are going to go all electric by X date. And on the other side, you've got almost every country and every major city in the world coming and saying, by this date, we're not going to even allow you to buy a traditional car, uh, an internal combustion engine, whether it's diesel um, or it's petrol. And so we're starting to see all these massive shifts. And then beyond that, we're starting to see an explosion. It's like the uh, um, uh, you know, massive shift in seeing these different types of form factors. You've got skateboards, you've got these small bikes, you've got hoverboards, you've got scooters, you've got uniwheels, you've got one wheels. Um, and is one better than another? Absolutely not. But each one's different and each one suits a different need. Uh, and again, we are in the very, very kind of early pre-Cambrian days of you know, the evolution of these, these form factors. Um, but it shows that there's going to be a huge shift in the way people think about getting around. Um, if you start to do the cost comparison between something like an electric bike and an electric skateboard, an electric skateboard weighs 15 pounds, and this bike weighs 60 pounds. Uh, when it comes down to carrying it up a flight of stairs, this is compacted down to this, but it's still a 60-pound, you know, twice the size of a briefcase. Uh, this I can throw uh, onto a backpack. Uh, in terms of speed, they both go over about the exact same top speed. Um, most have beginner, intermediate, and advanced mode, but if you're going through a city and in a bike lane, most people are riding around 14 or 15 miles an hour. Um, range, the M1 has seven-mile uh, range on it, but we actually have swappable battery packs, so you're able to open this guy up and swap out a battery at any time in about 10 seconds, um, where the electric bike has a battery that you have to charge for about four hours. Um, and in terms of motor and power, the electric bike is 750 watts and the inboard M1 is 800 watts, but we have two motors in each wheel. But one of the big thing, things here is the cost. You know, it's $1,300 for the M1, um, and it's $2,499 for an electric bike. So you're starting to see more and more people use electric bikes to get around. But if I live on the fourth floor of an apartment building, um, carrying it up a flight of stairs at 60 pounds is incredibly heavy and inconvenient. And if I'm going out after work with some friends to grab dinner or you know, run to a bar, uh, if everybody's jumping in an Uber and I've got this gigantic 60-pound briefcase that I've got to carry around, it doesn't make it easy. It doesn't fit into my life. And so this is the opportunity that we're going to see with these smaller form factor electric vehicles is because they're compact, because they're lightweight, because they can go anywhere with you, you're going to use it more often. And this isn't some like harebrained scheme that I'm coming up with. Um, this is a concept from Hyundai called the Ionic Scooter, and this is a concept from Audi. 
um, where an electric skateboard actually comes out of the bumper of the vehicle. So you'll drive downtown, park a few blocks away from your office, maybe where parking's cheaper or it's not as congested, and then you'll ride your last, you know, 100 you know, meters to a mile to the office. And on the Hyundai concept here, um, it's paired with their Hyundai Ionic car. Um, so when you open the door of the car, the scooter actually comes out of the door frame and you get on it and you go. And what they see is as we start to see the shift towards electric vehicles, the electric vehicle is essentially a moving supercomputer with a massive battery bank. And it can charge anything, including smaller electric devices. So it basically becomes a mothership, and then you can take out these smaller electric you know, rideables uh, out of them. And why, are, why is every single auto manufacturer uh, and transportation provider starting to think of these things? It's because cities are changing massively, and they're starting to embrace being car-free. In San Francisco, you've got Market Street, which is actually banning cars uh, this next year. You're only going to be able to ride a bike or be in a bus or a taxi. Um, Folsom Street, I don't know if you guys have seen that in San Francisco, but they're continuing to expand the bike lanes. Uh, the Champs d'Elysees, which is you know, the most popular street in Paris, is banning cars at the end of this year. Um, Oslo, banning cars in their city center, Milan, parts of New York, Paris, like it's, it's happening everywhere. And what urban planners are realizing is that if you give people an alternative safe way to get around, which is a bike lane and a protected bike lane, meaning that it has a curb here, um, it might be difficult to see, but in America, this is what we're doing here in you know, cities like San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Portland, is we're putting a small curb um, along the, uh, the side of the uh, road, and you're able to ride on a bike uh, in that kind of protected area. In Europe, they're doing the exact kind of next levels. This used to be a street, and they're stopping cars here, and now this is all for pedestrians. It's all for people to be on a bike, on electric rideable, at lower speeds, more people in a, in a compact space. And so it's actually increasing uh, the efficiency of a city. But beyond that, it's changing the culture of a city. We've built all of our cities in America really kind of post-internal combustion engine. So they've really been designed around cars. Uh, parking, uh, you know, from parking garages to street parking with meters. And what we're starting to see is if you embrace this shift, you give people restaurants, bars, communities, parks, way more access to be outdoors, to socialize, and it changes the social fabric of the city and the culture. And so in New York, there's a very successful project called the High Line. And this used to be an old railroad um, that was kind of decrepit and left. Uh, and now it's one of the like, most bustling and vibrant areas of the city. And people will travel blocks uh, to get to the High Line to go for a bike ride or go for a run. And these are the types of urban projects and the way that urban planners are thinking about cities, not only today, but in the future. And the reason that there's so much interest and attention to these shifts is because 51% of, car, of uh, trips that people take to commute are less than five miles. So it's a massive amount. And 21% of those trips are less than two miles. Uh, and a, the range of a product like the M1 or an electric, scape, uh, electric scooter is around five to seven miles. So it's right inside that sweet spot. You don't have to worry about you know, paying for car insurance, parking, um, you know, getting damage to your car, and you know, really it's the time. Because these things are lightweight and they're on demand, you can really use it whenever you want. And so what we're starting to realize is that there's a gap that's opening up. Um, today, um, I'll walk a quarter of a mile. You know, I'll walk to my car in the parking lot, but if there's a Starbucks that's you know, three blocks away, I'm gonna get in my car and I'm gonna drive there. I'm not proud of it, but it's what most people tend to do. Uh, You've got to deal with parking in the parking lot. You've got to you know, wait at the stoplight, the stop sign. It's actually you know, not that great of an experience, but it's convenient. And to walk you know, half a mile or a mile, it's going to take me you know, five to 10 minutes. But what you're starting to see with the shift to on-demand transportation, like taking an Uber or a Lyft, is that now all of a sudden, uh, I can wait five or six minutes and I can get a car that's going to come to me. I don't have to deal with parking and things like that. And if I'm in an urban area, that's great. But I'm also still willing to walk you know, a quarter of a mile. So now I've got, do I walk a quarter of a mile, which is about five minutes, or do I wait four or five minutes to get a car um, to go further? And so you're starting to see this gap open up for personal transportation. And this is the opportunity that we're super excited about, is that if I leave my house, I can throw down an electric skateboard, an electric scooter, one of these new form factors, I can get on it, I can go, you know, a mile, get there faster than I would in a car, not have to deal with parking, be able to bring it inside, and have a battery that charges really, really quickly. And so we've 
touched on personal electric vehicles, and I want to talk about how this fits into this massive change that we're going to see in all of transportation. Um, CASE is a kind of abbreviation that's been thrown a lot, around a lot. It's connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. And these are the key four things that are going to allow the adoption of electric vehicles. So number one is that the vehicle itself has to be connected, and you have to be connected to the vehicle. And thanks to mobile devices, we can do that. In 2005, Uber couldn't have existed, uh, but because of the smartphone, that's what allowed us to find a driver at any given time and immediately engage with them. The vehicles need to be autonomous. That's what's gonna bring down the cost of transportation. Uh, it's what's gonna make it safer uh, for cities. They need to be shared, meaning you know, I can hail it with my phone and a car will come to me. It's not something that I have to own all the time. And then the last one is they have to be electric. And they have to be electric for a number of different reasons. But one of the biggest is that if you get in an internal combustion engine car, there's about 1,800 moving parts in that drivetrain. And if you get in an electric car, there's 18 moving parts in that drivetrain. And so if you're a transportation provider, say I'm Ford, today I'm trying to sell cars. I wanna sell more cars. So if you get 150, 200,000 miles out of a car, that's great. But if I'm Uber, I don't wanna buy a car that's gonna last 150,000 miles. And I'm not buying a car because it's got you know nice leather seats. I'm buying a car because I want it to last a long time. I want it to last a million miles. And so now auto manufacturers are completely redesigning and rethinking the way that they actually build a vehicle because it's not about getting you know, five or eight years out of it at 200,000 miles. It's about getting a million miles out of it in about you know, four or five years. And so this is one aspect of the shift that we're starting to see. And once the cars are connected, once they're autonomous, once they're shared, intersections in cities are actually gonna start to look like this. If you have every car in an urban area having an autonomous, shared, and connected infrastructure, all of a sudden the cars can talk to each other, they can communicate, which means you don't need stoplights. And you don't need stoplights that you know, are gonna slow down traffic, create congestion, you're able to create a consistent flow. Now, most people would say, well, you, know, you can't do that because if you're the person driving a regular car, you can't drive in that ecosystem. In about eight years, you won't be able to drive a car in most cities. Humans will not be allowed to. And the number one reason is because of the cost of insurance. Once you get to about 15% of people driving autonomous or using like a, a ride sh sharing service like Uber and it's completely autonomous, insurance prices, because now you've got 15% of people who are not uh, paying for insurance, start to go up for anybody who's driving a human powered vehicle. As though that starts to happen, it creates a feedback loop. And so insurance prices start to climb insanely quickly, which means driving a car um, especially if I own it, I have to pay for the car, I have to maintain it, I have to pay for the insurance. Meanwhile, if I'm in an autonomous vehicle that doesn't have a driver, it's incredibly cheap, about 70% cheaper than you can get an Uber today. And so this is one of the reasons that this shift is going to happen so incredibly quickly, and most people don't even realize it. So this is 1900 Fifth Avenue in New York. And you can see this is a little bit difficult because of the bright light, but these are all horse and carriages. And over here on the left, it says, where's the automobile? And if you look really, really tiny, there's one automobile right here. And it actually looks like a horse and carriage. Um, the people who revolutionized you know, the automobile were not the people who were building the horse and carriage. It was people who understood mechanical engineering. It was you know, Ford who understand how to industrialize it and create the assembly line. Uh, it was Mercedes-Benz who understood the mechanical properties of an internal combustion engine. And so you can't look to the existing transportation providers as the ones that are going to disrupt the industry. So this is 1900, and this is 1913. This is 13 years later. And on the left here it says, where is the horse? And if you look, these are all cars, all automobiles, and if you look right here, there's one horse. And that's 13 years. The amount of change we're going to see in the next eight years in every major city in the world is going to be like five times that. You're going to see such a shift so quickly, it's going to be mind-boggling. And so one of the interesting things is when it comes down to transportation, when it comes down to living in a city, if I'm walking around San Francisco, New York, any city, and I get to an intersection, as long as I'm walking down the street, it's no problem. But as soon as you get to an intersection, you've got the crosswalk, you've got the don't walk sign, you've got the walk sign, and all of a sudden, cars take precedent. You know, I can't just walk across the street. I'm going to get hit. And there's a sense of just kind of uh, nervousness whenever you have to get around an urban area. 
And we already had, you know, AI transportation once, or at least intelligent transportation. If you walked in front of a horse and carriage in 1900, the horse would stop. You know, you could be on your, you could be reading a book and you could walk across the street and the horse isn't going to kill you. Today, if you are on your phone and you walk into an intersection, you're going to get hit by a car. And so the shift that we're actually going to go back to is going to be a lot more similar to the way that we actually used to get around an urban area when we had a horse and buggy. You can walk in front of an autonomous vehicle and it's going to see you as a person and you're going to get the right of way. Whereas if you do that in New York and you've got an angry taxi cab driver, they might accelerate. You never know. And so bringing all these things together, you've got lightweight personal electric vehicles. You've got a massive shift towards autonomous vehicles. You've got a shift in infrastructure where cities are starting to ban cars in certain areas. Um, and you've got a lot more technology that's happening. And so right now, there's a lot of early adopters of this product. They're willing to you know, learn how to ride a skateboard for the first time. Most of our you know, users are not skateboarders. They're getting on this product for the first time. Um, but the major concerns are like, is it safe? You know? uh, how reliable is it? Um, does it work in all different types of weather? And what we're going to see over the next couple of years is very similar to what happened in the drone industry. Drones in 2010, very, very difficult to fly, and you had to build them yourself, solder, soldering all your own you know, PCBs together and doing all your own calibration. I was you know, one of those really early adopters of drones. Then the DJI Phantom came out, and now they've got the Spark, literally a drone that my mom can hold in her hand. It'll fly up. She can wave at it. It'll take her photo, and it'll land back on her hand. Like That is an amazing shift, and it was using technology, but technology to make something safer, easier to use that it allowed the market to expand. And what we're gonna see in the personal electric vehicle market is by making the products easier to use, safer, you're gonna increase people's confidence and you're gonna expand the market massively. Uh, and in the next five years, we'll have products that range from child consumer products, so an eight or 10 year old could get on it and ride it to school, uh, to products that my mom, who's you know, 67 years old, could take to go to Whole Foods and pick up some groceries and come back. So th that's the type of shift that we're gonna see, and it's because cities are changing all that infrastructure, and it's gonna make it much safer um, to live in a city. And so what the future is going to look like is going to be something similar to this. You've got your you know, autonomous electric vehicle. We've got a Tesla Model X right here. Um, you've got your kind of shared public transportation in the middle. Um, you know, this is an all-electric tram. You're going to have a massive expansion in the amount of bike lanes. You're still going to have bikes. You're going to have different personal electric vehicles. And all these areas that used to be used for parking are going to turn into you know, outdoor seating for restaurants, for bars, for coffee shops. It's going to change the culture of every country in the world, but specifically, you know, the United States, where if you still go to areas of Europe in the city center, they were built pre-car and people, you know, shared things and they spoke outside. They had big city centers and squares. Um, and for the first time, really since the automobile in America, we, we're going to have the opportunity to completely reshape and rethink the way that we live and then really the fabric of our society and hopefully have a more engaging conversation and lifestyle. So on the bottom here, we've got walking. This is the easiest thing to do and everybody can do it. Uh, in terms of range, you'd probably then get on an M1 or a different rideable if you're just going to go a short range. Um, if you're going to go a longer range, you're going to go to an autonomous vehicle. And then if you're going to go really, really far, we're going to have hyperloops and we're going to have drones uh, to get us around all these different areas. Um, last thing that uh, I'm going to talk about is building an on-demand network. And you're starting to see this with stationless bike sharing, companies like Mobike, um, uh, where you're able to just find a bike on the street, scan it with your smartphone, and all of a sudden the bike unlocks, and you're going to be able to get on it and go. Um, I'm actually going to be at Web Summit next week with Mercedes-Benz. Um, they've got uh, a car called the Smart and a program called car to go uh, And so car to go right now, I can pull up a map in you know, a city like Berlin, and I can see all the different cars that I can just walk up and I can take. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked with them about is putting, you know, lightweight electric scooters and skateboards in the back of their cars and you can just walk up and you can grab a scooter and you can go eight blocks and then you can drop it off into another car to go. And so building that network of on-demand transportation is one of the other legs of the stool that's going to allow mass adoption because some people won't even have to buy it. In some cities, you'll just be able to use it as a service. And so at the end of the day, rideables, personal electric vehicles, they really give you freedom. You have freedom to live the life that you're currently doing. It fits within society and the construct as we live today. Uh, but you're able to get on a bus, in this case onto a trolley car. You're able to go, live within the existing infrastructure, and have that freedom of mobility. And it's something that you know, the team at Inboard is incredibly passionate about uh, in a future that we're super excited to manifest. Because 
in this small little nuance of building an electric skateboard, we believe that we can have a much bigger impact and help change people's consciousness and reshape the way that we get around our urban areas.